Perfect. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. This is Dana Myers with Southeast Community College. And I would like to thank all of you for joining us for this micro workshop on microaggressions and other communication topics. Our goal for this webinar is to help support positive and effective communication within our community as we continue to face personal and professional challenges during this unprecedented time. Before we begin, I wanna let everyone know that we will have a Q&A session following the presentation. Please submit any questions you have in the Zoom Q&A feature and we will answer as many of those as our time allows. And just a quick side note, uh, we do have everyone on mute. And um, so that's why we just encourage you to ask those questions through Q&A so we can get those addressed. With that being said, I would like to introduce Jillian Post. Jillian is an experienced process facilitator with content, content expertise in diversity, equity, inclusion, and conflict resolution principles. She also develops curriculum for projects and serves in several educator roles throughout Nebraska. Jillian attended Creighton University, where she received a master's degree in conflict resolution. Jillian thoroughly enjoys helping people find better ways to communicate, and we truly appreciate her taking the time to share her knowledge and passion with us today. And with that, Jillian, I will turn everything over to you. Thanks, Dana, I really appreciate it. So I, I think, I think the way we left it was tech issues go in the chat box and then presentation questions go in the Q&A. So if you're having any kind of tech technology issues and Dana will try and help you and please type those in the chat box. And we're going to go on to the tech check here. So um, if you're having audio problems, just type a message in that chat box and Dana will try and help. I'm gonna turn all these things over to her. We do have a tech person uh, who is also um, in our room. So, so here at the bottom, you see a couple of images. And if you click on participants, this is where you can raise your hand. If you click on this box, this will show you this little conversation bubble icon. And that's the chat box. You've probably figured that out. Um, you can virtually raise your hand. It's in the participants. Just remember to take it down when you're done. And just to review, the Q&A is, of course, the Q&A box. And that's where you're going to put your content-related questions. So without further ado, let's get into the content. Just a note, today's webinar is going to be a brief introduction to a few concepts meant to help you be more mindful about healthy communication in your various places, your work, your home, your families. And hopefully, it'll be a little bit of a bright spot during very challenging times. We have some learning objectives for today. We're gonna to briefly explore the history of inclusive language. We're gonna define, try and define what we mean by inclusive or identity-based language, also called person-first language. We're going to identify some words we have come to understand as microaggressions, and there'll be room for discussion there, so please place those questions in the Q&A box. Take a closer look at the connotation of a previously accepted term. Discuss communication models for addressing microaggressions. Examine what practicing these communication models may look like very briefly, and I'll urge you to practice more in your um, uh, employee resource groups and, and other opportunities that you have in work at home. And then we'll try and answer some questions. So first of all, let's touch on a, on, on a brief history. Um, today we're primarily going to be focused on our words. And um, we've all had experiences where words come flying out of our mouths and only after you know, sometimes weeks after, do we begin to rethink the words we use and the language that we use and understand the negative impact. So if we think about this from a historical context, this version of English that we use in the United States with all of its idioms and slang and 
you know, it's all con the contained words that in the past and present that leave groups feeling offended and marginalized. We scarcely even think about the impact. So when we think about change, we know that change is never easy. It asks that we try and examine deeply embedded habits and consider the implications. We often think of it in terms of intact, uh, intent versus impact. Some of these things have gone long and challenged. So we really have to dig deep into our own ability to empathize and imagine an experience that's not our own. So when we think about inclusive or identity-based language, and I mentioned it also is called person-first language, we know this. Language creates and maintains an environment of dignity, respect, and hope. Use, using language based on identity is also a more accurate way of speaking about people. It helps to eliminate, helps to eliminate the stereotypes that can form. So if we get into the nitty gritty of this, if we're saying someone is transgendered, we would actually change that to a person who is transgender. So like much of our learning, rarely is there an absolute consensus. Some people, some, some people um, like to be identified as black, black Americans. Some like to be referred to as African American. Some feel more included and empowered by their identity. So let's just take, for instance, an ability um, issue. So a person with a total hearing loss, they might refer to themselves as deaf. That's deaf with a capital D. They belong to the deaf community. However, for a person with bipolar disease, this would never be appropriate. So what this tells us is on the whole, this discussion is proof that language is never a one size fits all. And learning to ask respectfully how one wants to be identified is really paramount to creating an inclusive environment. So the title, of course, is a micro workshop on microaggressions. So what exactly are microaggressions? I know you've all heard that word before. You've probably studied it in various places. We have a very succinct definition here today. Um, that's not the only definition, but here's one. They are everyday actions, behaviors, or words that have harmful effects on marginalized groups and are often unconscious. We call them, uh, it's, Kind of connected to the whole, whole idea of implicit bias and implicit or unconscious behaviors and actions. And you see the little image down there that says, well, where are you really from? So we've, I've done it, you've done it, we've all done it. It pops out of our mouth before we ever really think about the impact. So I mentioned there are many kinds of microaggressions. Um, The most important thing to know and remember about microaggressions is that we all do them. Sometimes we're conscious of them, sometimes we're not, sometimes we do them deliberately, uh, but that we should never ever upstage someone else if we know more than they do about this topic, or the converse would be to shame someone when they don't know something about this topic. So here's some examples. Um, the, this is again focusing on the words. There are behaviors, there are other microaggressive behaviors such as wanting to touch someone's hair that has a certain texture you've never felt before. You can't know how bothersome that is to folks. So that's an example of another type, but today we're going to focus on the words. So we have these words here. Let's just take a couple of them and pull them apart a little bit. So let's take the term powwow. Hey, perfectly legitimate, perfectly legitimate term. If you are an, uh, someone from an indigenous tribe and you're speaking to them in context and you say, hey, what time does the powwow start this weekend? Not so good if you are not a member of an indigenous tribe and you say something to the effect of, wow, that meeting was a real powwow, wasn't it? You know, um, here's my favorite, you guys. So 
Um, super cool if you're in a poker game and everyone there identifies as male because we know that there's a spectrum of gender identity. It, but if everyone is um, identify, everyone there identifies as male and it's that kind of environment and then saying, hey guys, or you guys, that's cool. Um, unfortunately, I do, you do, we all do. We, we use this term so much. And when we're in work environments and professional environments, I think I urge us all to reframe that to, hey, everybody, or, you know, people say that you can only uh, use the term y'all if you're from the South, but I use it all the time. I think it's perfectly fine. And maybe we could discuss how that would be a microaggression. I don't know. There are lots of questions that remain. Let's take a closer look at a historical word, like the, the word oriental. So if you're in an estate sale and you find yourself discussing the price of an oriental rug or, or some piece of oriental jewelry, uh, that's a perfectly good word to use. But, you know, it's not so cool when you're using it as an adjective um, to use in a conversation referring to people that are from, that are East Asia, from the East or East Asian. You know, it's a, it's a word that describes things that come from that place we used, to, we used to know or we still know as the Orient. It's a word that was also used to refer to people who were either born in that sector of the world. But using Oriental as a noun is now considered offensive slang. I repeat, using that word is now considered offensive slang. And I heard someone use it not that long ago. It's even been banned from usage in federal law, as well as in a number of states where official documents may only refer to people as Asian Americans rather than that dated term. So we have these commu communication models that are often referred to as either calling in or calling out. So if we're going to call someone in, that means it's a little more private. A lot of times it's after the fact. It actually creates space for more mistakes to happen. And this is important. It prioritizes a relationship with this well-intended person. So the, the relationship with the person who has just said this word and you want to talk to them about it, you want to be very gentle, you want to be, you want to prioritize that relationship. Because maybe the person that it got directed to is already gone or has not even raised an issue. The last thing is it aims to get the person to change their own behavior, right? To take self-determination and change their own behavior. And then we have this other part, which is public calling out. That needs to be addressed in the immediate and obviously in the, in the public forum. If it's really bad and it needs to be addressed, if you're conducting a meeting or a workshop or you're in a situation where this word is so offensive that someone has used, it's so offensive it needs to be addressed or otherwise you look like the person who's allowing it. And it creates accountability and it prioritizes the impacted person and their well-being. And it also aims to get the person immediately to stop their behavior, their problematic behavior. So those are two very different ways to, to address this. So I want you to think about for a second I want you to think about, I want you to kind of, let's do a visualization, right? Uh, uh, some sort of visualization exercise without the, uh, you know, without the actual word. Let's close our eyes and imagine that we're in the break room at work. And we hear someone say, <clears throat> and this is pretty realistic. Well, this virus would have never happened if it wasn't for the fill in the blank. It's a very highly offensive word. That's the word I'm thinking of. So as coro a coronavirus has spread across the US, so have reports of violence against people of Asian descent. And the FBI warns that a surge in hate crimes sh could yet to come. It's, it's already happening. So even the fears have led to a creation of a website re for reporting such attacks. And it's this FBI website is recorded, um, it's registered more than a thousand incidents in less than two weeks. 
and these numbers are sure to rise. So how would you approach this person? What would you say? How would you phrase it? Making sure not to come off as, as condescending or, or in judgment. Because really shaming someone does not work. It's a, not a good strategy. So in closing, let's take a look at this last, one of the last slides. I say here, practice, 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 because um, you find yourself in these challenging situations, right? And the words don't come out so smoothly. <laughs> they, you feel nervous, you feel, uh, you know, your heart beating, you want to say something. Maybe this person has more power than you, so the power differential creates a, uh, a scary feeling in the pit of your stomach, but you know what they've done is wrong. And hey, I've helped myself in this situation. I'm sure we all have. Again, there's no shaming involved. Um, I'm thinking about somebody recently in a training. Actually, I was just finishing, I was just finishing a process. And the person who I report to, the person who really should have known better, said something to the effect of, um, because we had been working with Thai, um, people from Thailand um, in the room, uh, in fact, with an, with an interpreter. And this person said, wow, that room really stinks of garlic. Um, I can't believe it. You know, I, I mean, I love their food. Uh, but, you know, wow. And I didn't know what to say. I felt very uncomfortable. I had only met this person a few times. She did have more power than me. She would be able to extend me more work. I'm ashamed to say that I didn't say anything that day, but I wish I had because there's, two, there's a key word in there. The, there, those people, these people. When we use language like that, that's a, a red flag, right? We're separating, we're, we're, it's an us, them situation. So let's just look at a, a few examples here, a few ideas that you could practice. So if you frame the confrontation in a form of a question, you might say something like, huh, do you feel this way about the whole group or just this individual? Another way to approach would be to kind of sort of implore an egalitarian self-concept. So, hey, I, I, I always thought you were a little bit more open-minded than that. And then we could focus on how their actions make us feel or how their actions make others feel by saying just simply, I'm uncomfortable when you say things like that. Could you, you, could you find a different word? And then the last one there is of just avoiding self-righteousness and that power over concept. And you might say something just like, you know, with all the stereotypes we encounter, I can see how you might say that, uh, but we should really all try harder to avoid thinking that way. So these are really generic kind of sort of sample sentences that can help you frame how to kind of dig in in your various work situations and do, you know, what your heart is telling you to do, uh, which is to correct, um, you know, first of all, correct our own behavior, but then expand it and correct, um, you know, those people who we have relationships with where we know we can have an impact. We can actually change the world by calling people out on these behaviors, on these microaggressions. And there's a whole lot of work we could do on other kinds of microaggressions. Um, like I said, these, these slights and slurs and jabs and jokes and the things that we hear, you know, our, our uncle Tom or Bob or whoever say, where, you know, we've heard them say, for, say those things and use those language, that language and those terms for years, but we've really never, had the guts or the verbiage to approach them. So this, 
this is really just meant to help you start that process. So as a reminder, this mini webinar was intended to give you just an introduction on how to address one communication challenge of many. So for this, the full day one, one the full one day interactive workshop, um, which I will also be teaching, was going to be teaching until uh, you know the virus took over our lives. It's called Being Radically Inclusive, It's Not So Radical. If you search for it, you would wanna use the keyword inclusive on the Southeast Community College website. And hopefully when our time of physical distancing, I don't like to call it social distancing. I like to call it physical distancing because we're physically apart but socially, we're still finding ways to, um, to help one another and, of course, be there for our various groups and communities. So currently, it's slated for July 18th. We'll see. Uh, we'll see what happens. So we're going to ask some questions. Uh, you're going to ask some questions, and we're going to try and answer them. And Dana is my chat, my question, my Q&A box. Mm -hmm um person for today yes so what do we have dina yeah so does if anybody has any questions go ahead and submit those we'll take a few minutes to answer um whatever you all might have so if there's anything you've thought of so we're not we're gonna take we're gonna give you about five minutes that's just gonna seem like an eternity <laughs> but I want you to I want you to take in the information and I want you to to really think about this and if you really think about this you will come up with some questions and we'll try and we'll just you know we'll 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 get them out there we'll take a look at them so we're just going to be really quiet for a minute no uh -huh. actually about 3 minutes and let you come up with some questions Okay, so we do have a question, Jillian. Um, this question, they are asking, how should we react if it's a student's comment that is inappropriate? So, um, of course, there are many different contexts of student instructor. Um, I, I, I think you're probably maybe talking about uh, college age. So. Uh, if you could give me some a little bit more information, that would be helpful. But let's just assume for now that it's college age. So you're a college instructor, uh, professor, and you have a student who's who is exhibiting inappropriate behavior. And for the through this context, we're going to we're going to keep it in the microaggression uh, area. I can't help you if they are. I don't know running around the room and scribbling on the, the blackboard. I don't know. But for now, you're talking about the kind of behavior that falls into the category of a microaggression. So is it, first of all, ask your, yourself uh, another question. Is this so bad that I have to set an example in the public, in my classroom right now? Do I need to address this person right now? Are they combative? Are they a strong, do they have a strong personality? Will they able, do they need to have this addressed in public? Or are they a, um, a shy person who, who appears to really not know? Um, they, they don't, they haven't maybe sought out different workshops and, and educational opportunities. And it appears to you that it would be very harmful to, to everyone to stop what you're doing and address this person publicly. Then you would want to make a note to yourself, wait till the next best time, a break or the end of class, and pull them off into you know a different room where no one can hear and say, tell me a little bit more about the word that you used. I wanna know if what the history behind that for you. That's how I would do that. We have another question? We do. How do you handle calling in 
or out your superior in a meeting to hold them more accountable? Should we call them out or in? Wow, that is also um, very context oriented. So, um, you know, you know, put yourself in that position. Uh, you know, maybe we've all been there and we know that there are different levels of power. To me, it really has to do with the power differential in the room if it exists. So um, if you are, if you, I mean, if you exist in, a, in an organization that still has strong hierarchies, and many do, and you are the bottom guy, person, ah, see, there I go, the bottom person on the totem pole, another microaggression I just used, see, we do it all the time, the bottom person on the, the ladder, um, and you are fearful of losing your job, um, and if, you know, if, if you approach them publicly in the meeting, in the workshop, and, you know, that doesn't feel comfortable to you, I wouldn't do it. I would definitely do it afterward. But if you are their direct report or you know you you feel like you have the authority to do it right in the moment, that would be the preference. Because then you're setting an example. You're being a leader for your workmates. Um, you're saying, you know what? I recognize this, I see it, I hear it, and I'm gonna speak up right now. And you can still temper it. You can still temper it and not use a condescending voice, not use a power over voice, not challenge them, but more or less put it in the form of a question and say, huh, you know, I don't, I don't know about that word you just used. And then that opens discussion as opposed to, to being, I don't know, demanding. Another question? Yes. Um, we have one. Do you feel microaggressive language is trending up during the last few few years, perpetuated or fed by social media? Yes. <laughs> um, typically, when we, you know, yes, no questions. Just as a side note, will oftentimes bring a they will bring a conversation into focus, but they also don't continue the dialogue. My short answer is yes, <laughs> but. But it's complicated. It's complicated. State, state the question again, Dana. Do you feel microaggressive language is trending up during the last few years, perpetuated or fed by social media? Um, microaggressive language has always been there. And it's waxed and waned through the years. It's certainly waxed over the last few couple years um, with um, the advent of being given permission uh, by certain public behavior. But um, I think it's always been there. So social media, what social media has done is it's given us the platform to make that, to make that microaggressive be behavior and those microaggressive words public. That's what social media does. It, we know everything that everybody has on their mind every second of every day and the anonymity and there's been studies about what anonymity does to us in chat rooms. It, it gives us permission to be even raunchier than we usually are. So yes and no. So they added to their question. So do you feel we are more aware of it because of social media? I think we're more aware of it because diversity, equity, and diversity, equity, and inclusion work has those of us who do this work. You know, the work has grown exponentially. the The need is so great to address this behavior right now. So the awareness actually is a good thing. Um, not, you know, if you're talking about the increase in the behavior, that's a bad thing. But the awareness of this happening is a good thing. So. You know, life is full of gray areas. So social media is the best and the worst thing that's ever happened to us. You know, we can, we can communicate. We can talk to our family members. I did a Zoom meeting recently, family meeting with my mother who's in assisted living. And, um, you know, she struggled with the technology, but we made it work. And she was able to see seven members of her family. So that was awesome. If we had been Zoom bombed that day, 
um, which I made sure didn't happen, um, you know, or in any other context, um, then it would have been a negative, right? So nothing is really completely positive or completely negative. It's a little bit what we make it. For sure. Okay. We have a couple more. Let's see. Oh, we have a few more, so we'll see what we can get to. Okay. After calling someone in or out on microaggressions, how can we hold them accountable moving forward? Um, you know, that's an interesting question. I, if I'm not a manager in a workplace, but if I was, I might do, I might consider doing what I like to call like a social contract, right? So actually, um, you know, I wish every workplace had an ombuds person or some kind of conflict resolution person who is designated for those conversations. And I wish they were trained in all of these various things, but they're oftentimes not. But you know, if you have a good HR person and you have a good conversation with them, one of the, one of the things they should do is say, you know, so this is the first time, you know, depending on the circumstances, you know, this is the first time I've ever heard you do that. But I hope that going forward, you can self-correct. How can I help you? What if we write down, um, you know, what if we write down a, a kind of agreement between between you and I, and we we try to be aware of that word, and then we kind of check back in a month and see and see, you know, how how you've done. I think that's a totally totally reasonable um expectation. Um, one question is, you mentioned touching someone's hair can be a microaggression. How? Okay, so, um, I am a very direct person. I just put the words out there. Um, I try and be careful with the words I use, but I'm just going to state this. Um, and I'm going to describe this situation just as it is. As a white woman, um, me or anyone else, this is just an example. Let's say we live in a not very diverse part of the country. And we suddenly find ourselves uh, across the country, across country um, in Washington, DC, in a situation where all of a sudden there are people from Kenya and Dubai and you know various places of the world whose skin color and hair texture is much different than ours. And maybe they have like incredible braids or incredible dreadlocks and you are so mesmerized by them you want to go up and touch them perfectly you say to yourself perfectly um a heartfelt innocent desire but for that person not so cool that's what i'm talking about when i describe a microaggression with regards to hair Do you have any recommendations on reliable resources regarding current inclusive language? Um, well, the research is out there. It's, it can be all over the place. Um, of course, there are good resources. One of the, I have to put a, I have to put a plug in for one of my clients, I guess. I subcontract for Inclusive Communities, which is an organization in Omaha that many of you may have heard of or not. They do um, high school age and workplace and they come on site and do various work, pieces of work. And off, I, I am a facilitator for them. I also do this with this work or I'm trying to do more of this work on my own. And you'll see my credentials here in the next slide. But, you know, if you can talk to your your peeps, you know, your, your people, the people who can arrange something like this, we can bring in the resources. We can help you. There are all kinds of places, directions to take this work. So maybe it's just an hour. Um, maybe it's a lot. Um, one of my recent clients was in the um, Nebraska probation officers training cohort. So we did several months of contract work where it was just a lunchtime conference call no video and i just led a conference call on a specific subject matter and oftentimes we chose it together and so i do the research and i put the powerpoint together and then we use that as a framework much like we are today 
to have a conversation, a real conversation, not, not a webinar where um, you're listening and you're submitting your questions via a box. We have another question. We're knowing one, two more questions. Okay. So knowing what is or isn't a micro microaggression seems to shift and change over time. Mm -hmm. Are there strategies or ways of thinking that we can use to keep up with these changes? Or is it just a matter of considering how our words may impact others? It's both. Um, if you are an active listener, which is one of the conflict resolution skills that everybody should use when you're in your workplaces and when you're doing this, this DE and I diversity, equity, and inclusion work, if you're using your active listening skills, you can tell when you have offended someone, you can tell when the words that you have used have, uh, with the greatest intent, the best intent have had a negative impact. And with regards to the, the history of language, that, that first slide, and let's go back to it. Um, you know, idioms and slang abound that will offend you or I or someone else or no one else. But we can generally say with certainty that call, oops, calling, calling an L, an, a person who's in an assisted living, I'll use this example because I've lived it. Um, again, my mom's in assisted living. There was, she, she was in a skilled care center for a while and we actually progressed her to assisted living. So the young, very young CNA who was working with her, um, just, just insisted on calling her sweetie pie. And it drove me nuts because my mom is a very intellectual woman. She's 87, but she's very much about her dignity. And I, instead of calling that person out, I could have said, hey, don't use that word. That's a bad word. I flipped it and I looked at my mom and I said, hey mom, how do you feel about that term? Um, do you want to be called that? And if not, what would you like to be called? And she said, well, my name is Dolores. And that young CNA never did it again, to my knowledge. And I were, you know, I was around her a lot for several months. So, so just that little acknowledgement, she should have known better. And I actually talked to the, to the, uh, uh, the skilled care for centers, skilled care facilities, um, administrator and drew her attention to it and so she said no I'll, I'll, I'll work on that I'll address it so maybe they worked on it together as a group but um, it's fluid it changes you have to pay attention you do your own research um, you know educate yourself a little bit but these words right here on this particular chart are certainly um, some some good examples all right, so we have, looks like we have time for one more question. One more question. Um, so this question, so first off, they would like to thank you for the webinar. You're welcome. And the question is, imagine for a moment you were black, black African American. How would you react to covert racism or microaggressions? Would you call it, would you call it in or out? And how would you do it in a way that wouldn't cause backlash against you, your goals, and your career? Well, that is the million dollar question, isn't it? Because if you are a person of color, if you are a black American, or, or if you are a recent immigrant or refugee or any of the other marginalized groups or, <clears throat> or um, minority groups that have to face these behaviors every single day, practically. You know, you have choices and you have, you have a, a almost insurmountable challenge to weigh the benefits of trying, of trying to address it in the moment and make sure that 
this problem gets a microscope on it, right? You have to choose between that and, and, you know, if you're a single mom and you have, you know, your family at home and you must, you must um, not lose your job. They would be very stressful for you to lose your job. And you know, you've seen in the past when other people have, have um, confronted, you know, this person, this aggressor, um, that it hasn't ended well. Then you have a heavy task ahead of you to try and, to try and decipher, you know, what is more valuable to you? You know, is it so, is it so egregious that you have to say something in the moment? Because we know these things happen. They happen so frequently that some people become despondent. Um, you know, some, some folks face this, this so frequently in, in their contexts that they just become, just, they just decide, I can't. They become resigned that this is going to happen to them for the rest of their lives. So our systems are, are, are just entrenched with racial divide, uh, particularly in these really scary times when, I mean, it's, it's really, it's Darwinian, right? It's scarce resources. It's people fighting over toilet paper, for God's sake. Um, and so all of the crap comes to the surface when we are challenged by these, by our inabilities to address these situations in the moment. But I would urge you, and I'll end with this, um, with this ideology to share with you. Nobody should allow themselves to be trampled on ever but you do have to pick your battles and you want to try and approach a person with um not anger not treachery not revenge but if you really are intent on making progress with this with these microaggressive behaviors then you need to approach a person with empathy if you can <sighs> Um, and also pragmatism and a calm voice. Say, hey, come over here. Let's have a discussion. Take the power over out of it. Let's have a discussion. You used this word toward me and I'm really offended. And I would like to, dis I would like to have a meaningful discussion with you about this. When can we do it if we can't do it right now? That's how I would address that. So I told Dana that we would uh, present for about 30 minutes, 20, 30 minutes, and have about 15 minutes worth of questions, and we have done that. So we're drawing to, the, to a close. Um, you have the capability of saving the Q&A, Dana? Um, I can, yes. There are a couple of questions we didn't address. Okay. Um, one of which is if um, they would have access to the slides after the presentation, so we can look at that. We Dana and I are trying to decide whether we we are recording the. Did I didn't I didn't say that did I? Well, there's no visuals on here. No, no right. Okay, that's cool. Usually, you always want to be very careful that you tell someone you're recording it. So this is recorded, and we have not decided whether we're going to make it public. This is. Um, this is a conversation we'll be finishing. <laughs> so uh, possibly, yeah, possibly. And there's quite a few of you, so I won't be able to, um, I won't be able to do, get really personal with the question answering, but um, we'll figure that out. Dana, what can yeah. we do? Yeah, if you, um, all of you who would like to have perhaps a copy of the PowerPoint, um, and if there's some follow-up questions we answer, some additional information, you can email me. You all should have my email. That was, um, I believe, part of the Constant Contact and the Eventbrite. So just let me know, and I can send that information to you. And, you know, I would be perfectly willing to take emails as well. Um, I don't want to be inundated. I will have to be really careful about how long that goes on, but I would love to have conversations, more conversations with you. And here is my contact information and just a little, you know, my little 
squirrely little business card that I created as I, <laughs> as I have begun to, to consider whether, you know, how deeply I want to go into this work. I mean, I, I might, I might take it further. I'm not sure. Um, yeah. So you can copy that information down and you can certainly email me. Um, I will do my absolute best to answer questions. Dana will do her absolute best to make the connectivity between all of us. And I guess the resources are on how we distribute them are kind of yet to be decided. Right, Dana? Yes. Okay, cool. All right. All right. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you for attending today. And there might be more of these coming up. We'll take another kind of subject, sub subject, and we'll deconstruct it a little bit, explore it a little bit, and see what we can see what we can learn from one another. So thank you. Yes. Thanks, everyone, and have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.